So we're going to be talking about recombinant DNA techniques in chapter 17. Here are the learning objectives. Make sure you can answer all of them. Also, I highly recommend watching the videos I posted on the Facebook group under chapter 17. These will give you a better understanding of some of the techniques you'll be seeing. So molecular cloning, what is it? Basically, we're taking a part of a gene or some DNA sequence, and we're making large quantities of that so that we can study it. So how do we do that? We transfer that DNA sequence, and we insert it inside of a cell. That cell is going to grow and reproduce as it normally would. And while it's making its own DNA, it's also going to grow and reproduce the DNA sequence that we inserted. So one of your learning objectives is to define clone. So this third bullet is very important. So every individual microorganism in the colony is derived from that original single cell and contains the same identical transferred segment of DNA. So this is referred to as a clone. So the DNA sequence that we inserted inside of that cell, as the cell grows and reproduces its own DNA, it's also making a copy of the DNA sequence we inserted. So everything inside that microorganism is going to be identical to the segment of DNA we inserted. So that's referred to as a clone. So this process of growing large quantities of the sequence is called molecular cloning. And then once we have those large quantities of the sequence, we can isolate it in its purest form and then we can use detailed molecular analysis to learn new things about it. So here's a simplified scheme of DNA cloning. There are a few things that you should understand from this slide. So the first thing is understand what a vector is. And a vector is just a DNA molecule that can replicate autonomously in the host cell. So an example of a vector is a plasmid. So a plasmid is a specific type of vector that carries the foreign DNA. So if you look at the picture to the right, top right, you'll see a DNA sequence. We're going to cleave certain sites of it, and that's going to be the foreign DNA that we're inserting into our plasmid. So once we have our plasmid and once we have our foreign DNA, those two are going to ligate together and you're going to make a chimeric plasmid. And all that is is just the plasmid DNA and the foreign DNA. So that's going to be inserted inside a bacterial cell and it's going to make copies of your plasmid. So that's cloning right there. So if you follow the left hand side, you'll see that there are multiple plasmids made and this is where we can isolate the purest form of the clone and then use it for detailed molecular analysis. And then on the right hand side we can grow them under conditions that allow expression of the clone gene to make proteins. So know what a vector is, know that a plasmid is an example of vectors and then understand that plasmids are circular double-stranded DNA they replicate independently, they carry antibiotic resistant genes, and then they contain three critical components. So all plasmids have an origin of replication, one or more selectable markers, and one or more restriction sites. So all of these bullets are very important to understand. So the second part to learning objective one is defining restriction enzymes. And restriction enzymes, or endonucleases, all they do is they cleave certain segments of DNA. So if you look back at the previous slide and look at the top picture, in the plasmid we have to have a cleavage site. So we have to remove a part of the plasmid so that we can insert the foreign DNA. So the restri restriction enzyme is the one responsible for cutting the foreign DNA and then also the cleavage site in the plasmid. So restriction enzymes look for double-stranded sequences, um, especially palindromes, and palindromes are just that both strands of the DNA have the same base sequence when read in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So they cleave the DNA segments by cleaving the phosphodiester bond, and some restriction enzymes, like ECOR1, is going to produce a sticky end, and then on the slide, some enzymes like SMA1 are going to generate blunt ends. So important to know that restriction enzymes, they look for double-stranded sequences called palindromes. 
what do they cleave? They cleave phosphodiester bones, and then eco R1 generates sticky ends, and SMA1 generates blunt ends. So essentially, this is the step from two slides ago where you're going to make your chimeric plasmid. So that's just having your plasmid DNA and your foreign DNA. So in other words, it's called recombinant DNA. And this is all done by DNA ligase, who joins them together. So eco R1, as we talked about in the previous slide, generates the sticky ends. And DNA X, let's say that one is from your plasmid. And DNA Y, let's say that one's from your, uh, that's your foreign DNA. So eco R1 is going to produce the sticky ends of them. And then it's going to join them together by DNA ligase. Once you join it, you're going to have a chimeric plasmid, otherwise known as recombinant DNA. So here's just another picture illustrating that the target DNA to be inserted in the vector are, is going to be cleaved with the same restriction enzyme. So you don't have to remember these enzymes. The only enzymes you should pay attention to are ECOR1, which produces sticky ends, and then SMA1, which produces blunt ends. So there are several different methods to detect the DNA sequences that we have been cloning. One is simply just pouring the bacterial colonies on the agar plate. Uh, the agar plate usually contains nitrocellulose paper, which allows the colonies to adhere to it. And then we usually treat it with some sort of alkali to disrupt and denature the DNA. So that means you're going to separate the two strands of the double helix. And then we also heat fix the DNA in place so it doesn't move. Um, we also hybridize it with a probe. And this allows us to identify which DNA sequences we've cloned. And so later we'll talk about hybridization and probing more in detail. So DNA libraries are just a library full of fragments cloned that we've collected. So there's different categories just like a regular library. There's the genomic DNA library. And inside the genomic DNA library, we have clone fragments from an entire genome of an organism and that's generated by using limited amounts of restriction enzymes. So theoretically, genomic DNA libraries contain all of the nuclear DNA sequences. And then we have cDNA libraries, which is very important to know since it is part of your first learning objective. So cDNA library contains the hybrid vectors with cDNA inserts. So each clone will contain an intact gene, and each clone has no introns. So cDNA stands for complementary DNA. And then there's screening libraries, and that's just going to allow you to identify the clone carrying the DNA insert of interest. So we identify it by using nucleic acid hybridization, which we'll talk about later more in detail. So this is another technique called gel electrophoresis, and it's going to allow you to separate your DNA sample on the basis of size. So you'll notice that there is an electrical field a negative N at the top and a positive N at the bottom. So in picture A, we're inserting the DNA sample into the wells of the agarose gel. And you'll notice that larger molecules migrate a lot slower to the positive N than smaller molecules. And remember, DNA has a negative backbone. So when we insert it, it's going to want to migrate towards the positive N. So really, the key thing to remember is the direction of migration. So smaller molecules are going to migrate a lot quicker to the positive end than larger molecules. So part of learning objective five is knowing about electrophoresis, which we discussed in the previous slide, and then knowing these three techniques. So southern, northern, and western blotting, the key things to remember are the differences between them. So southern blotting identifies DNA sequences on the gel. Northern blotting identifies RNA sequences on a gel, and Western blotting identifies protein. So if it's identifying DNA, it's going to be Southern blotting. If it's identifying RNA, it's Northern blotting. And if it identifies protein, it's going to be Western blot. And then also pay attention to the bottom. So we use a DNA probe for Southern and Northern blotting, but we use an antibody probe for Western blotting. So those should be the key things to remember for this slide. So here's just a few bullets on southern blotting. I would highly recommend watching the video that I posted so you have a better understanding of it. 
So if you haven't already watched the gel electrophoresis video, I would highly recommend you do so, so you have a better understanding of how to read gels. So here we're talking about the southern blotting technique and how we can use it to test for sickle cell anemia. So basically in a person who has the sickle cell anemia, they are going to lack the MST2 gene. And so if we look at the gel, beta globin S represents um, an individual with sickle cell anemia and the beta globin A represents a normal fragment. So if the fragment matches up with the beta S, then that person has sickle cell anemia. So Will, for example, has just one fragment that matches up with the beta S, so that means he has sickle cell anemia. Carrie, on the other hand, she has fragments of both, so she's just the carrier having normal and the mutant. So be able to read these, watch the video if you haven't already, it should help you a lot. So a quick and easy way to get a lot of DNA very quickly is using the PCR technique. So this is Learning Objective 4, and I would highly recommend doing the virtual lab that I posted in the Facebook group under Chapter 17 links. So a few things you need for PCR. You need the DNA template. You need deoxyribonucleotide bases. You need your DNA polymerase, and you need a PCR buffer. So there's a few steps. In denaturation, we're going to take our DNA template strand and we're going to heat it up to a high temperature so that the strands will separate. So the second step is annealing and primers are going to hybridize to those single-stranded DNAs so that they don't come back together. So in extension, which is the third step, your DNA polymerase will come in and add the nucleotides. And then this is repeated for multiple cycles. So key things to remember are the materials that you need for PCR, the temperatures for the different uh, steps, and then just do the virtual lab so you can picture all of this in your mind. So again, re-emphasizing the temperatures and the steps. So we take our DNA and we put it in a thermal cycler and it will go through each of these every cycle. So here again, just your gel, be able to read these and understand what the fans mean, what the ladder means, and everything will be explained in the gel electrophoresis video. So if you still haven't watched it yet, highly recommend you do so. So here we have the Sanger method, also known as the chain termination method. I would just watch the video for this as it can get a little complicated. So please watch the video that I posted in the Facebook group under Chapter 17, The Sanger Method. So learning objective six is defining polymorphism. So polymorphism is the presence of genetic variation within the population. So the human genome contains millions of different polymorphisms. We can look at these to diagnose diseases. And these are caused by point mutations, deletions, or insertion. And polymorphism usually occurs in the non-coding regions. So last bullet says only 2 to 5% of the human genome codes for genes and most polymorphisms are present in non-coding regions. So I would definitely know that polymorphisms are present mainly in the non-coding regions. So here we have something called RFLP or restriction fragment length polymorphism. I would watch the video for this but essentially we use this for forensic science. So let's say we have a blood stain. We can extract the DNA from the blood cells and using 
restriction enzymes, we can cleave the part of DNA that we want to analyze. So we insert it into a gel and separate it by gel electrophoresis. We use the southern blotting technique to transfer the DNA fragments to a membrane. And then we can add a radioactive DNA probe to hybridize the DNA and put it on an x-ray film which we can detect a radioactive pattern. So this allows us to analyze or find who the criminal was. So go ahead and watch the video on RFLP if you want a more in-detailed explanation. So you're likely to see an exam question like this, so be able to read these gels. So the question is, which alleged father's genotype has the paternal alleles? So at the very top, we have the alleged father 1, and those are his DNA bands, and then we have alleged father 2, so those are his DNA bands, and then we also have the mother. So look at one column first, and look where the fragments are similar. So if we look at AF1 in column 1, there are no fragments in the child that match up. But if we look at AF2, we do see one that matches up. And then we can also find the ones that match up with the mother. So if you go through this, see which fragments match up, you'll be able to tell that AF2 is the father of the child. So this is more of a FYI slide. He won't test on this, so don't worry about it. So here's a way we can test for cystic fibrosis using oligonucleotide probes. So you could expect a question like this also, either this or the gel electrophoresis. So be able to interpret it. So if we look, the father, he is a carrier since he has the normal and the cystic fibrosis fragment. Child one is a normal child because uh, the child only has the normal. Child 2 is also a carrier because it has both. And Sissy Fibrosa has the cystic fibrosis gene. So she is the one who is expressing the mutant allele. And then the mother is also a carrier. So if the question asks which member of the patient's family has cystic fibrosis, then it would be Sissy Fibrosa. If it asks which member of the patient family is normal, then it would be child one. And then if it asks which member of the patient's family is a carrier, then it would be the father, child two, and the mother. So again, he could ask you questions like this. So what is the difference between the normal and the mutant cystic fibrosis gene sequence shown on the gel? And what effect would this difference have on the protein produced from this gene? So moving to the next slide, you'll be able to see. So if you look on the left side, we have a normal person, and on the right side, we have a person who has the mutant allele. So if you look at the normal sequence, it is P-A-P-P-A-P. If you follow from the bottom of the normal, you can see that each band represents the sequence. So P-A-P-P-A-P, P-T-T, P-G-G-T. So all of that follows the normal sequence. But you'll notice in the mutant allele, you're missing three bases. So if we start from the bottom right, it goes P-A-P, P-A-P, but then it skips the P-T-T, because those are deleted, and it goes straight to the P-G-G-T. So you can tell that that one is the mutant allele, since it is missing the three bases. So everybody's human DNA is going to contain a certain amount of sequences that are repeated in tandem a variable number of times. So the regions that are called highly variable regions are because of the variable number of tandem repeats. So you should know because of the NTRs, that is what causes the high variability between individual A, B, and C. So probing is a way to identify the DNA sequence. So if we have a double-stranded DNA, we need to separate the strands first, so we use heat or alkali. Once we have our single-stranded DNA, we're going to insert a probe. And the probe is complementary to the sequence of DNA, so it will hybridize to it, and that's how we identify the DNA sequence that we want to look at. So this is just showing you that we can use probing to detect certain diseases like cervical cancer, but he probably will not test on this 
so just for an FYI. So still part of learning objective 5 is knowing a different type of method and this is called DNA microarray. So go ahead and watch the video for this and it will be a lot easier to understand. So here's another technique called fluorescence in situ hybridization, otherwise known as FISH. So go ahead and click the link that is an interactive tutorial and it will explain this to you. So here list several ways that we can use recombinant DNA to uh, prevent and treat diseases. So we use recombinant DNA in vaccines or production of therapeutic proteins like insulin and human growth hormone and also small interfering RNAs which we'll talk about. So here's a slide we've seen before. Your siRNAs and microRNAs are going to regulate protein expression at post-transcriptional level. So meRNAs, they will induce and degrade mRNA or they can block translation. And that should be the key thing that you take away from this. So here we have RNAi and I'll let you just read through this and if you have trouble understanding, go ahead and watch the video on RNAi, siRNA and miRNA under the chapter 17 video links. So just an FYI slide here. So this slide talks about the RNAi, so I would read through this if you have the chance, but I wouldn't worry too heavily on it. So here's learning objective 7, knowing gene therapy, gene ablation, gene silencing, and genetic counseling. So gene therapy involves just inserting a normal gene into a disease cell and hoping that the normal gene gets expressed and allows the disease cell to return back to normal. Gene ablation is essentially the surgical removal of a gene in hopes of inhibiting production of whatever protein that is causing disease. So here's an example of gene therapy using retroviruses to introduce a therapeutic gene. So if we insert a normal gene into a retroviral vector, it's going to enter the target cell, it's going to go through reverse transcription, and then it's going to integrate itself into the host cell genome. So the idea behind this is that if we can remove the retroviral genes by replacing it with the therapeutic gene, then the viral proteins are going to die. So there are some problems with this. Um, it has limited applicability because it only works when human host cells are undergoing cell division and then the technique only works on small genes. So sometimes when we insert it, it has to be random, thereby causing cancer. So the next few slides are just FYI. You can go ahead and skip to proteomics. So here we're going to talk about proteomics, the study of proteomes, which is the entire complement of proteins. So why proteomics? So learning objective 9 is knowing the applications of proteomics and how it can be useful. So proteins are the active biological agents in cells. DNA sequences don't show how proteins function, so we have to look at them some other way. Proteins undergo post-transcriptional modifications. 3D structures affect protein function. Alternative splicing can occur. So I would know these for the test. So this slide just shows the increase in complexity. You'll notice that proteome has a million human proteins versus genomes, which is 21,000, and transcriptome, which is 100,000. 
So here we talk more about proteomics, the study of proteins expressed by a cell. You should know that proteomics can determine if a protein is upregulated or downregulated. You should know that we can use proteomics to differentiate between normal and cancer cells, and then we can use this data to identify potential targets for future therapy. So we can also use proteomics for developing new drugs. So here it talks about proteomics using mass spec. I would definitely know this slide because we were tested on this. So how does mass spec work? You create ions and there are several methods using the ionization method like MALDI or electrospray. Then you separate the ions using a mass analyzer and then you use um, a mass spectrum or database analysis to detect the ions. So you should know which ones fall under creating ions, which ones fall under separating, and then which ones fall under detect ion. So here we have some of the methods, ESI and MALDI. So it's important to know the description so that you can differentiate between the two. So go ahead and take a look at the previous slide to know where they fall in. So this is just showing you the proteomics using mass spec, but you really don't need to know anything from this slide. So objective 10 asks you to know the different uses of PCR and DNA fingerprinting in a crime scene. So here list the uses for PCR. Definitely know these. They will be tested on. So sensitive detection, medical diagnostic tests, forensic detection, and genotyping. So be able to read through these. So here we have DNA fingerprinting to catch a rapist. So PCR was used to amplify the regions. Then we run it on the agarose gel using gel electrophoresis. We transfer it to the nitrocellulose paper to observe the bands. And then we collect the results to compare evidence. So if you look at the gels, you'll notice that suspect 2 is the one that matches with the evidence. So suspect 2 would be your rapist and murderer. So be able to read these agarose gels, and if you have trouble reading them, watch the video on a gel electrophoresis if you haven't already. So your last objective is knowing how human insulin and E. coli is produced. So really all you need to know is that human insulin has an A chain, a B chain, and a C peptide. So lastly, we have our disease table in chapter 17. So just look at the disorders and the details about each.